Welcome to the Triage Method podcast with me, Gary McGowan, and my co-host, Mr. Patrick Farrell. How are you this week, Patty? I'm positively fantastic, Gary. How are you? I'm fantastic. Wonderful. You absolutely love to hear it, Gary. And you're in the middle of exams like me? No, my exams start on uh, uh, Monday week. Well, I've had some kind of, but like proper exams Monday week. It's fair enough. I've just had a few essays to do, which that's what they replaced our final exams with. So I've done those. Now I have two, only two left. And then I'm fucking finito. But anyway, Gary, we are talking about a topic today that, you know, it kind of gets discussed, we'll call it peripherally in the health and fitness sphere, even though it actually has a, a huge amount of relevance for pretty much fucking everything that has regard to health and fitness, right? Um, so today's episode is going to be an intro episode because there's obviously a lot to discuss. It, it, this, you're not going to get all of the information you need in a single episode, right? Um, so what I want to say at the start of this is that first of all, neither of us are doctors. Gary's a trainee doctor, but that's basically useless. Um, yeah, useless. So... This is not medical advice. I always like to give that disclaimer. You know, this is effectively just entertainment. You know, we do also plan on writing more in-depth articles on these topics. So whatever you can get from a discussion, you know, we're literally just two guys randomly chatting, you know, that should not be taken as your ultimate source of knowledge and you know, the point where you get all the information you need or have about a certain topic, you know, you should still be going more in depth into the topic itself, rather than just, you know, passively listening while you're doing the cooking or out for a walk or whatever it is, you know, like this kind of stuff does need a bit more attention to detail, you know, and the topic is relevant if you coach people and if you are training yourself and if you're just generally interested in living a healthy life, a healthy and long life. And the topic itself is the heart. Okay. And um, there's a lot of facets that we want to cover over the next few episodes and um, both related to how to get things right, we'll say. And then also like how to navigate when things go wrong. Right. Obviously, we're not going to be talking about, you know, you having a heart attack, you know, and being like, oh, this is what you should do when you have a heart attack. Like, that's obviously not the case. However, there are certain things that we can influence and move the needle on uh, with regards to, say, blood pressure and, you know, heart rate, different things that you have a lot of, well, some control over um, with regards to how you set up your training, how you set up your nutrition, how you set up your lifestyle practices, that kind of stuff, they do influence some of these things that we're going to talk about. But to open this entire series out, um, we need to do some basic overview, basic function, you know, just the basics effectively. Um, and that's where young Gary comes in. Yeah. So as Paddy said, we're going to be talking about the heart. And if you've listened to me and Patty d discuss anything for a while or discuss our triage mission statement, you know, one of the, the ultimate goals is basically to, to bridge that gap between the, the fitness industry as people know it and like frontline healthcare, healthcare professionals, um, the medical industry, you could say, uh, because like one of the, one of the growing problems that obviously everyone is aware of is that, you know, the main problems that we're dealing with at the moment in terms of morbidity and mortality, um, pretty much like across the world as time goes on, um, is our preventative or yeah, pre preventable rather non-communicable diseases. You know, they're diseases associated with, um, lifestyle pretty much, you know, so cardiovascular disease, diabetes, other complications of obesity, etc. All of these diseases are fundamentally lifestyle related diseases. Um, and but obviously influenced by, you know, your environment, your genetics, um, all of those other factors. And it um, should be mentioned, especially at this time, you know, like, with COVID and everything the way it is, like you see a lot of the people that are succumbing to it, you know, they have comorbidities. And if you look into that a little bit more, a lot of these comorbidities are, you know, 
we'll call them preventable things. Now, obviously, again, as you said, like a lot of this is genetics, a lot of this is environment, a lot of this is stuff that you you may have some control over, but you don't have you know total control over. You know, but obviously, we're not going to talk about this stuff. Like, I'm not going to go here. You need to get CRISPR technology done. You know, to change your your genes so that you know you don't have uh, always have high LDL or whatever. You know, it's like that. that obviously, you if you you're genetically predisposed to that. You know, you, you can't do a huge amount, but you can still move the needle on some things. But anyway, back to the thing, you know, if, if there is a, a situation such as this COVID, you know, epidemic, pandemic, whatever, um, and you know that, you know, people are, you know, have four, like the median in New York was four comorbidities, you know, and again, if you look into that, some of these things are very much preventable, you know, so obviously, like we talk about it a lot, like we want to make resilient humans, you know. So if you have preventable comorbidities and then that re results in you succumbing to a disease in the future and, and that was preventable, like that's obviously something that we want to tackle. That's something that we want to, you know, help move the needle with regards to. Yeah. And, and I mean, the, f the first step for me, like for, for that ever being a reality where personal trainers are more likely to be kind of liaising formally with medical professionals and healthcare professionals like is it's fundamentally knowledge you know it's knowledge it's upskilling it's having a higher standard for personal trainers so that you can actually begin the conversation and that's one of the things that i think i've seen as being a problem over the years whether it be observation of my own personal training education or the steps that were needed to be able to understand things on a deeper level and the difference between, you know, the, the formal education that I undertook and maybe my personal training education, all those things and working with other personal trainers, what you begin to see is that some of the very basic, um, basic things related to, let's say, um, the, the heart health or cardiovascular disease or whatever, things that would be, should be very much within a, a personal trainer scope to at least be aware of, um, they're often not. So things like uh, blood pressure, you know, if you, if you go to some advanced personal trainers, and I mean, you know, people who've really gone and tried to learn more themselves or go to courses or whatever they might know some of the real basics of what blood pressure is but if you were to go up to most personal trainers in gyms and you were to ask them you know what's the what's could you tell me a bit about blood pressure and that you know the systolic the diastolic like what's good what's bad like what affects these things they're unlikely to know and that that's not that's not necessarily a fault of their own because they've come into a career um, that didn't necessarily train them to understand these things so um from just, my perspective just, just on that like again like if you put this in the context again looking at personal trainers like this is not to say that you need to go really in depth with this stuff no. you know um but a lot of the stuff like it does like it does have an influence on how you actually train people. For example, if you have someone that has high blood pressure, you know, a, a more advanced, you know, trainer might be aware of, okay, overhead press, that may be something that we need to look out for, you know, a leg press machine, you know, like these kind of things, which build up, looks we'll like a higher level of blood pressure. If you want to put it like that, you know, there's something that you need to be aware of when you're programming for someone that has high blood pressure, you know, and you can, learn this or we'll say learn in, in a way where it's like you just know the counterindications you know someone comes to you they say i have high blood pressure you're like okay in my head this exercise this exercise this exercise or this training modality you know that's probably not a good idea for that you can learn it if, you can learn it from that perspective or you can have a, a deeper understanding of the the principles behind that underlie like why that is the case and you know it probably makes more sense for a long-term uh you know, training career that you understand the, the principles so that you can actually help more people. Yeah. And, and a big part of it as well is like, it's not even about, it's, it's nothing to do with intervention. And like, and that, like exercise is one of the most potent things for reducing blood pressure. Like it's so powerful, but before we even get there, like I'm, I'm, I'm talking about people just understanding, being able to be in the conversation so that when a client comes in and says, um, I've got high blood pressure. My LDL was a bit high, you know, when I went to my doctor that a personal trainer is able to say, cool, I'm aware, you know, I'm aware of what that is and that they're not going to like overstep the mark by, you know, exploiting something that could potentially make those problems worse. You know, like for example, if you're, if you're advising a client and you're saying, um, Oh, you know, having loads of salt before your workouts is super great for performance. And they're used to speaking to an athletic population. And now they're speaking to someone with hypertension, high blood pressure. 
that's something that that will be useful to be aware of. So we're not even talking about like trying to come in and fix these things, but just being aware of like, okay, when my client tells me that, I'm aware of what that actually means. So to get to today's topic, it all starts with just understanding the heart. Like the way I look at it, this is not medical information. This is not medical physiology. This is nothing that should be within the realms of medicine only. Like this should be basic personal trainer stuff. It should be the interested trainee stuff. You know, if you're trying to basic you know, improve human your heart, stuff, you should know what that, your heart does. Exactly. It's like, it's worth knowing like how your body actually works on a basic level. So when, when we, when we start off and we, and we think about the heart, you know, obviously um, everyone has some level of understanding that the heart is essentially um, a pump. It essentially pumps blood around your body. And, and that is a, a very true. And it's a, it's a very good starting point. Um, in terms of like what you're actually talking about, you're talking about a pretty, pretty large organ, you know, it's probably, probably bigger um, than you think. If you look up some images of like uh, hearts in cadavers, um, especially if you if you see someone who's had cardiovascular disease, like hearts can be very very large. And one of the things that the people probably um, have seen in, in drawings and stuff when you're a kid, you know, you see the heart on the the left side of the body and it's kind of up in the top left. And that, that's not entirely true. It's kind of more so in the center of your chest. Like it is slightly to the left, but it's it's definitely more central um, than people would think. And basically it's, it's within your lungs essentially. And what I, what I mean by that is like, it's not literally in there with air flowing around it, but your lung essentially wraps over it so that it's kind of hidden by the lungs a little bit. So it's in there nice and cozy. Um, so your heart, basically what you've got in your heart is you've got different chambers. And I think a lot of people will be aware of this from, I think you even do this in junior cert, junior cert science, junior cert biology, like you do the basic um, chambers, but basically you've got your, your atria and your ventricles. So basically what happens is blood flows into those atria, those chambers, they're at the top of the heart um, or at the top, at least in a drawing. So if you, if you look at the right side of the heart, basically what's happening at the right side of the heart is all the blood that has been used by your tissues already. So the oxygen has been taken out of it. Basically what happens is that blood flows back in your veins and it pours back into to your atria. Okay, so it's coming from the systemic circulation. Uh, basically what it's going to do, it's going to come back to the right side of your heart into your, your right atrium. So all that blood is now deoxygenated. Okay, so it's deoxygenated. So if you think about what that actually means, it means, okay, we need to get oxygen back into that blood before we push it out into the circulation. So basically what happens is it pours into that top right chamber, then it pours down into the right ventricle. And what happens is that contracts or squeezes and much like, you know, a carton of juice or something, the, the blood then squeezes back out through the pulmonary, uh, the pulmonary artery. And basically what that means is that it's going to your lungs. Okay. So very simply, if you have deoxygenated blood, it's got no oxygen in it, it's going to go to the lungs. And what happens there? It gains oxygen. Okay. And carbon dioxide leaves, but basically we're going to keep it in terms of, right. We're trying to get oxygen into that blood. Then what that, what happens then is it pours back into the left side of the heart. Okay. So it goes back into the pulmonary veins into the, the left atrium. So now we've got oxygenated blood. Boom, we've got our oxygen, we've achieved our goal. And what happens then? It pours out again from the left ventricle. So that squeezes again and pours it out into the systemic circulation to your quads, to your hamstrings, to your calves, to your brain, everywhere. Okay, so that's basically how we're getting blood around the body in a very, very basic format. Okay, so yeah, and just go ahead. on that, like this is also, like you can see from that system, this is why it's called like the cardiovascular system. And yeah. this is why also people talk of it in the context of also again like cardiovascular training and all of a sudden they start talking about you know how you are breathing you know like people will say like you know oh we're going to do some cardiovascular training and they might you know judge their effort based on how like how their actual breath is going because that is you know correlated here with how much oxygen you're getting into circulation you know and um, so that's the first thing and you want to look at the things like the lungs are part of this system as well you know obviously we're not going in depth on that right now the second thing i want to say is just bringing it back a little bit as well like blood like you also need to understand like what your your blood is like it's basically like a, we'll call it a super highway you know so people like on I, I know i used to think of it as well like you know you think of blood and you maybe think of like red blood cells you're like oh like blood red blood cells and that's kind of all you you think of in blood but your blood actually does contain a fuckload of things you know different proteins different energy substrates like 
all that kind of stuff. Like the, the food you eat is transported in your blood, you know? And I used to be really disconnected from this and just think like, oh, when your, your heart is pumping, it's, it's really only like pumping those red blood cells around because people only ever talk of it in the context of, oh, we need to, you know, effectively reoxygenate the blood, right? And obviously these red blood cells are, you know, the, the hemoglobin and stuff is the, the thing that is, you know, carrying that oxygen. So I only used to think of it in that context. But it is also pumping around all of those nutrients, right? Now, this has a con. This, if you're listening to this and you're going, ah, this doesn't really apply to me, you know, I'm young, I'm fit, I'm whatever, but like you're like, oh, I just want to build some muscle. Like this, this has application here because, you know, if you want to get nutrients to the working muscles to, you know, refuel the muscles, it makes sense to have a very good super highway system, you know, a cardiovascular system. And um, because then it makes everything more efficient in terms of getting nutrients where they need to go. You know, does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. And it, it is a, it is a really important point because like, obviously if you think about the importance of that, you know, during exercise or during the recovery period of exercise, you need to be able to deliver nutrients to the exercising muscles or the recovering muscles so that they can actually get what they need in order to perform better or to recover. So, you know, there's a and, lot of, and also take away any like byproducts exactly, from, yeah. from those muscles. Like again, like people always like to say like, you know, the lactic acid burn, that's not ne necessarily true. It's, it's really lactate. And um, but one of the ways that you get rid of that lactate is like put it into the general circulation. Like obviously you can go to surrounding muscles to be de dealt with, like by uh, monocarboxylate transporters and stuff. Um, but you know, it goes into circulation, goes to the liver, then gets changed into other things, um, you know, that are more easily dealt with, you know. Um, so, like, you, you want to think of it as well. Like, uh, your, your your blood does help you recover in between sets, but it also helps you perform those sets, you know. And like, obviously, we're talking about that from like a, a purely like gym setting or training setting, but like that's everyday life, you know. Like, your set could be like walking up the stairs, you know. Like, everything you do is reliant on an efficient, you know, cardiovascular system. Yes, sir. Um, so yeah, that, that's kind. Of, that's kind of where we are. Basically, a, a very simplistic, like level one understanding is that like your veins are bringing, to bringing the blood without oxygen back to the heart from the tissues that gets pumped to the lungs comes back from the lungs back into the heart and off it goes into the aorta with its new uh fresh oxygen ready to keep all of your tissues alive um so that's a that's a vitally important system you know if you're not getting that oxygen to your brain like it's a very short time before you start to develop problems the the the, the requirements for oxygen like the develop they differ between different different tissues and stuff like that but your brain is a particularly a uh, fragile organ when it comes to uh, not receiving what it needs to receive um so yeah when you when you start to 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 break that down then so i mentioned i mentioned atria i mentioned ventricles you've got all these different valves as well that kind of fit in within that discussion it's probably less relevant to our to our exercise discussion but just at a, a very basic very basic thing that's probably worth noting is that if you're probably you, you could be wondering like okay if you squeeze that chamber you squeeze that ventricle why doesn't the blood just backflow and basically the reason that doesn't happen is because you've got valves that come over between the atria and the ventricles to stop that backflow taking place so that blood can then kind of flow out um, smoothly through the aorta if it's going out through um, through your systemic circulation. So like your aorta is like quite a, it's quite a, a very large vessel if you actually look at it. Um, and if you think about, think about what that's actually, what that's actually overcoming. Like if you're, if you're pu pumping out this massive quantity of blood and you're trying to push that all around the system, there can actually be quite a lot of pressure developing and there can be a, a lot of work that that left ventricle has to do. And as a result, what you, what you tend to see is that the left ventricular wall, so basically the heart as a kind of a back step, it's made of muscle, okay? It's made of a specialized type of muscle, cardiac muscle. It's a little bit different skeletal muscle in a number of ways, has some, some similarities. Um, but basically what happens is that muscle is actually much thicker um, on that side before you ever consider exercise or anything because of the work that it's always doing. So because it has that, that, that real hard job of pumping that blood out um, against that resistance, that basically leads to hypertrophy, much like uh, you'd experience in your in your skeletal muscles, your biceps or whatever, when you're doing exercise. Um, so, like, what what where that becomes relevant then is if you've got some some 
what, for whatever reason, you have an increase in resistance like you would in the gym, that's when you can start to potentially um, experience uh, higher blood pressure. So for example, if you've got, if you're, if you're systemic vascular resistance, the resistance in all of your blood vessels or some of your blood vessels, if that begins to increase um, because of potentially uh, a really high salt diet, potentially that can happen. Um, and, and other different factors. If you're, if you're, no, if you're super stressed um, and you've got the stress response all the time, that can increase the resistance um, of some of your blood vessels. And as a result, you might actually have higher blood pressure than when you measure it because what's essentially happening is when that heart has to squeeze and push that blood out, there's more resistance that it's fighting against. And because there's more resistance, much like in your biceps or your quads or whatever, um, you increase the weight there's basically more pressure. So there's more pressure um, required to, to overcome the, the resistance, there's more force required. So the pressure is higher. So that's kind of like a, a basic way of kind of understanding blood pressure. Um, just, just on that it. as well, like, again, like blood pressure, like you need blood pressure, you know, you like you, need you need it to push it around the body. Like people can't like, again, you get this kind of disconnect where you're like, of blood pressure you just think of all the negative connotations mm-hmm. around that you know when in reality you know that's i mean high blood pressure right and in mm-hmm. cer- certain circumstances like higher blood pressure is required for the activities you're, you're engaging in like you were saying like you might get higher blood pressure when you are you know pushing out a, a, like exerting yourself a, a lot you know um but also like blood pressure is required and it is required for the actual like vascular system itself like the, those like the veins arteries and stuff they do require some we'll call it stretching they require that kind of force to keep them like the, effectively the micro environment of those cells and all the all those structures in there they require a pressure to keep them you know correctly functioning you know and so like you shouldn't think of blood pressure in a negative way because I, I know there is that kind of disconnect as soon as someone says blood pressure everyone always just thinks n- negatively right but also like this kind of stuff especially in terms of you know the actual vascular tissue itself you know you can start seeing how other things that seemingly are unrelated start playing into this for example if you go to the gym you might see that people recommend taking some sort of like a citrulline malate or something right um, and they'll be like oh it increases my pump you know i got a better pump in the gym and then you look into it a little bit and it's like okay so this seems to have something related to nitrous oxide you know and you're like oh it's kind of dilating these blood vessels you know and it's like oh so it's actually easier now to pump blood around the body you know and you start putting these things together of little bits of knowledge that you've accumulated and once you start going okay i actually understand the basic functions of the heart now I have a better understanding of why these things may be contributing to my my overall health, my overall performance. And, you know, then you start going, okay, so how how do I integrate this into either designing my own personal training plan or, you know, how do I go and integrate that into actually helping other individuals? And as as Gary said earlier on, and I think I said it as well, you know, like we're not coming up with, oh, this is how we treat heart disease in a, personal training setting or anything like that that's not your job you know that's the job of a doctor you know but the more you understand of this stuff the more you can be like okay normally i would recommend x again like you said earlier on maybe a higher salt intake but now you have a client that comes to you and they have higher blood pressure so now you kind of go okay let me relay this back to the knowledge that i have on you know the basic heart functioning and stuff like that and okay so there's these counterindications I'm not going to recommend that for this population, you know? Yes, sir. Absolutely. Um, so yeah, that's basically your, your kind of your, your vascular stuff. Um, we can, we can go more in depth for people on that sometime if they'd like, because like the vasculature, like your, your capillaries, your arteries, your veins, your venules, et cetera. It is quite interesting and definitely probably a lot more interesting than people actually think because like, you've got tons and tons of different receptors in those, in those regions that respond to different things, whether it be circulating like noradrenaline or, or certain agents related to uh, expanding your vasculature for, for the good or for the bad. Um, so that it is quite interesting stuff. And they're not, they're, de- they're not just the kind of inert like pipes 
that people kind of describe them as. And I think if you think of it only in terms of that, it can really limit your understanding. They're actually quite dynamic. They've got muscle, you know, so, so they, they are quite, quite interesting structures. The way um, but I yeah. always conceptualize that because it's actually like really easy to conceptualize that the, the veins and arteries and stuff are dynamic. And the way I conceptualize that is boners, right? Like your boner is effectively just blood. You know, so like it is a dynamic process. It's not just like, oh, it's just blood vessels that don't, you know, change shape or anything like that. You know, obviously that's like a boner is not just, you know, veins and arteries and shit. You know, it's like, oh, there is actually like muscle tissue and stuff there. Um, but it's an easy way to see like, okay, so if the amount of blood that's going to these areas can change this structure, like you can obviously use the pump as well in terms of like a muscular pump in the gym. A boner is just more easily, you know, <laughs> visualized. Um, but you know, you, you start seeing this like, okay, so the actual environment does dictate the, the shape of this kind of stuff. So once you kind of get that in your head, you're like, okay, so the stuff that I do does actually make a difference in this tissue. And again, this can seem very esoteric, but you know, if you put this into a, a, a lifetime or a longevity uh, perspective, you know, you, you start to realize that there are inputs that your your vascular system needs to be healthy long term you know like if you just sit around and do absolutely nothing then you, you know the the environment has dictated that you know that vascular tissue is only so strong you know you, you've never challenged it you've never tried to push the, the envelope with the development of that vascular tissue it's never had to you know change in response to you know a higher level of exertion you've, you know you've never you know gone for a job you know, you've never done anything like that you've never had to like you know, dilate these, these vessels. And then all of a sudden you're 70 years old or 80 years old or 90 years old. And you know, you're on the toilet and you're, you're straining to go to the toilet. And all of a sudden you have an aneurysm because that vascular tissue has not been getting the inputs over a lifetime, you know? And now obviously that's, you know, completely you know, hyperbolic being like, that's, that's the reason that, that happens. I'm just saying that like, you can start to see how these things play into the, the, the long term. Yeah. Uh, and, and the fact that like your blood, your blood vessels essentially like they change in their composition with time as well. And they accumulate damage, you know, much, much like anything else. And, and that is worth understanding because some of the things that we will be discussing um, in future episodes uh, kind of related to like, for example, cardiovascular disease and nutrition, we'll be speaking with, with some people about that. It actually is very relevant to understand that the, the vasculature, like that it's not just like this inert pipe, because like if you've got like really high, blood sugar, you know, that's something that can damage um, your arteries, you know, it can damage your blood vessels. And say, same if you've got, um, a, you know, a, a variety of other conditions that could potentially affect that, you know, even your, your high, high blood pressure can potentially damage the, the actual vessels themselves. And then that can lead to some of the downstream processes that lead to uh, cardiovascular disease. But yeah, um, we won't sweat that too much for the moment back to the kind of basic functional stuff. So yeah, you've got your, you've got your idea where you've got your four chambers in the heart, right? Very simple. You've got the muscle that's overlying it. It's a little bit thicker on the left. It's got a bit more work to do. Um, and then you've got the blood vessels that are attaching to it coming to and from. Okay. I'd advise you, like, if you do want to learn more about this, like, firstly, we've got two articles on site that cover this stuff um, in more detail, like with more specifics, because it's easier to see pictures and stuff. Um, and you can look up on, on Google images, even like pictures of the heart, the anatomy of the heart, etc. if you are interested. Um, but moving on to like, one of the questions that I think people probably don't ask themselves, or if they do ask themselves, they're like, geez, I wonder how that works. Not sure. You know, you've got basically your heart, like, it is, it is innervated. And what I mean by that is it has nerves going to it that allow it to work. But one of the things that you're probably aware of is that you've never really had to think too much about your heart beating. Okay. So I've just told you, it's like your muscles in your arms where they're working hard against resistance. You know, they adapt in a similar manner, but why don't you actually have to think about it? And the reason you don't have to think about it is because basically it's got multiple different ways of regulating its function. So it's, it's, it's innervated by the autonomic nervous system. Um, the way I, I like to remember that is autonomic is kind of like automatic. Okay. So it's just kind of unautomatic, you know, it's, it's just running by itself. It's autonomous. Um, and that's basically broken up into your, your sympathetic and your parasympathetic nervous system, primarily sympathetic, 
it's your stress stuff, your fight or flight stuff. So the stuff that's going to make your heart go, you know, beat super fast, beat super hard to enable you to get out of any kind of, you know, stressful situations or perform exercise, etc. And then your parasympathetic nervous system is essentially the stuff that calms you down. You know, it comes to help you out. It's your, it's your paramedic. It, it calms you down in a time of stress. It begins to relax you. Um, and that's the, the rest and digest, you could say, some people will say. Um, so basically, you've got those two branches of the nervous system that are helping to kind of regulate the heart's function. And it's also got like a number of like really interesting and unique um, aspects of its nervous system. These little nodes, you know, your SA node and your AV node and these different um, fibers that run around the base of the heart and stuff. And basically what they do is they allow the heart to operate you know, independently. So it's kind of just, it's constantly just ticking over. It's like, right, beat, 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 beat. You know, it's constantly doing that throughout your lifetime. It's a repetitive cycle. It's really elegant. And this is all the result of, you know, different uh, ion channels and stuff like that that are in the heart and in these specialized areas that differ from your standard muscle that you'd have in your calves or your arms or your, your chest or whatever. Um, so basically what that allows it to do is constantly, um, beat on its own, you know, to, to be consistently on its own. And that does, that does vary. So as I said, if you've got, um, that kind of stress response, that sympathetic nervous system, if that's activated. So if you're about to give a speech or you're exercising, or you just had some caffeine or whatever, the stress response is going to then be activated. And that can be the result of circulating noradrenaline so you're basically your 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 adrenaline your stress hormones kind of you could say basically they're being re- they're being released elsewhere from the from the adrenals and basically what that is doing then that's going to come and act on the heart and that's a re- really interesting phenomenon because that's happening along with the actual nervous system itself so it's not just the the nervous system it's also a, a hormonal effect so things that are circulating within the blood and one of the interesting things to kind of illustrate that is that you see when when people let's say have heart transplants one of the things that they do is they have to cut those um those nerves to the heart so the sympathetic and the parasympathetic nervous system so you're kind of wondering then oh god how how is it how's it going to be regulated as i said it's got those elegant nodes but it also starts to be a bit more responsive to the noradrenaline that's circulating so you can see how these these kind of adaptations and there's compensatory mechanisms so basically those things allow the heart uh, to regulate its, a, its, its beating, its pace. And when you're exercising, you're going to have more of that sympathetic response, that stress response that increases the force or the contractility of your heart. So it's increasing the force with every beat, and it's also increasing the rapidity of that beat. So it's going to increase faster and faster and faster and faster because basically you're, that, that, that's just constantly depolarizing. You're getting these faster contractions, faster contractions, faster contractions, um, and your heart, unlike your skeletal muscles, like you can hold your biceps and squeeze as hard as you can in one position, you know, but that doesn't happen in the heart. And that's all the result of very specific ion channels that give, give it its unique function because it would re- be a really bad time if your heart just squeezed and didn't open up again, you know? So there are some of, some of the variables that go into determining um, how the heart just kind of ends up, ends up beating on its own. Yeah, on that, like I always think it's actually it's actually a really like cool rabbit hole to go down on, and that's the the, the function of like pacer cells within the heart, you know. And um, but obviously this is, that's it's too much of an in depth discussion to have like right now for this this overview. But what I do want to mention on this is there, first of all, on the autonomic nervous system, like this, it's I actually think it's really cool because like we always think of like higher cognition and we're like oh all the stuff that we think about it's like that's that's the important stuff but like realistically like the stuff that we're allowed to think about that's the stuff that our body is like you know that's so unimportant to my day-to-day life that you know you're allowed to think about that all of the stuff that's actually important like you know regulating how my digestion works regulating my my heartbeat and keeping all that stuff it's like your brain it's too stupid to think of that stuff you know we're we're gonna, we're gonna have that be automatic so the important stuff you know, you don't think of it. You know, I think that's a, a a really important thing to realize that it's like, you know, the stuff that you actually think about, that's the less important stuff to your being. You know, the important stuff is like, your body's like, no, you're not allowed to think about that stuff. Like imagine trying to think of, oh, I have to beat my heart. I have to beat my heart. I have to beat my heart. You know, like. Some effort. Yeah, exactly. Like it's, it, that's, you wouldn't be able to think of anything else, you know? So your body's like, all right, you're too stupid to, 
you know, regulate this process, you know, with the brain, your brain is too stupid. You know, I have to use the other stuff and actually do a good job of this, you know? So I know in, especially in like uh, Western li literature, like we have this big focus on like all the brain as like this huge center of like, Oh, you know, thought and, you know, higher cognition. And, you know, it's basically the hub of what it means to be, you know, a human, you know, like whenever you think of yourself, you probably think of yourself as being in your head, you know? And, um, but like in reality, it's like, not like, no, that's the, that's the, the 5% that we're allowing you to, you know, actually think about that the rest of the stuff, that's the actual important stuff, you know? So this is why when you hear us also say stuff like, you know, um, like you could move before you could think, you know, like a sing single celled organisms and stuff like movement is more important than thinking. Right. However, you know, thinking and moving are both important. Obviously that's what it means to be a human. You know, we have evolved to do both processes, but would recommend both. Yeah. Actual movement is a fundamental of what it means to be a human, right? Like all that autonomic stuff, like that's fundamental to what it means to be a human you know, to be, to be alive, you know? So like you need to look after that stuff as well as looking after the brain stuff, you know? And, and the second thing I just want to say on that is there are actual sex differences between the, the response in terms of the nervous system and, you know, the stress response and different stuff like that. And like we might do another episode on that entirely, but I just want to say, because every time you read stuff on this, it, it makes it out as if it's very like there's, this is the, the only thing that happens like it's a very linear process and it's as if like the the response is the same in every one ac across the board but there are actual sex differences and this actually does play out in terms of you know say heart disease risk between males and females you know it's like okay so there are actual differences in the processes that go on and in some in some cases they're you know re relatively meaningless it's like that it doesn't make a huge difference but in other cases you know something that is what appears to be relatively meaningless does actually become more important when you start talking about, you know, a lifetime of that relatively meaningless thing, you know, accumulating and adding up, you know? So I just want to say at this stage, because you know, we might do another episode on it entirely, that there are sex differences and, you know, you do need to keep that in mind, especially if you are a, a female or you coach females, you know, you want to be like, okay, so they said they had high blood pressure, but what does that actually mean in terms of, excuse me, a, a male and a female you know yes sir um and unfortunately us fellas tend to be a little bit worse for the whole the high, the high blood pressure thing a lot of the time you know and we don't go to doctors as well until like yeah doesn't doesn't really help <laughs> like i've actually never been to a doctor well i have actually been to a doctor ever ever like i've never actually been sick so i've never gone to a doctor so like i could have all kinds of shit wrong with me but I'm like, yeah, I'm healthy. So you definitely do. I'd say psychiatry would be your, your service. Oh, yeah, yeah, probably you're dead right. Came out of the womb and was just like, get the fuck off me. You, what the fuck? <laughs> I was like 11 pounds when I came out of the womb. So fuck, probably was like that. Flexing. I was a fucking unit. <laughs> um, but yeah, so so guys, that's our kind of like our basic uh, podcast one hundred and one overview of like the the real basics of like, all right, what is the heart? Okay, as I said, like that's not that's not all you need to know or all that is interesting. We've written about all the things that we that we think might be important as a kind of an overview in a and part there one. There are more articles on the way. Absolutely, part one and part two. Um, series of basic cardiovascular physiology. So if you want to learn more about that, go there. But this is there's also still more to come. So like the, the next kind of part we want to basically transition to now that you understand, okay, the heart's a pump. It's got these chambers. This is how it works. It's fairly autonomous. Um, it increases in speed. It decreases in speed. Um, it's basically the heart and exercise. So like the first thing to understand, like on a, a very basic level that people are probably aware of, but they don't really kind of tie it together a lot of the time is that like when we exercise, um, we're fairly dependent on tissue oxygenation. So we need to be able to get oxygen to those tissues to be able to keep producing um, energy aerobically at least. And that's the case for the vast majority of what we call exercise. And that even includes your resistance training. It includes repeated sprints. All of these tasks are still heavily aerobic because although they have contributions from anaerobic energy production, it's very short lived and its recovery is quite slow. Um, and the longer a session is, the more aerobic it's going to become. So, you know, basically if you're doing repeated 
repeated sprint efforts of like uh, 200 meters or whatever, let's say, the longer you get into that workout, the more and more that workout is going to become more aerobic in nature because you just won't be able to keep producing the same amount of force or move at the same speed because you, you can't recover those systems that quickly. Um, and that's and one of the... We've done like three podcasts on like energy systems. Yeah, we've touched on all that. Like we have covered this and there are articles on the site. Yeah, so definitely go back and listen to the energy system articles and the cardio stuff. I think it wasn't that long ago, a couple of months ago we did them. Um, so go back and listen to those. But that's basically just like reminding you of that reminding you that you do need to be able to get oxygen to your tissues and as patty said to be able to remove the waste products be able to remove your, your your carbon dioxide to bring lactate to the liver um reduce acidosis all these different things they're all dependent on your circulation so it is a, a really important thing so th that kind of sets the background for understanding okay if I need to, if I need to be able to get this oxygen to those tissues and remove these byproducts, etc., then it's probably pretty important that my heart is working quite hard, and that is the case. And that that generally scales with exercise intensity. So the more intense you're, you're working out, the more intense you're running, the more intense you're lifting, or whatever, the more that rate of your heart beating is going to start to increase, and that does vary a bit between what I'll just call continuous exercise. You can think of it as just as cardio, you know, out for a run or whatever it varies between that and between our standard kind of resistance training. So if you're lifting weights in the gym, because if you think about what the actual demands are, the demands in, let's say going out for a run, if you're running at 140, 150, 160 beats per minute. So 70, 80% of your max heart rate. If you're running at that and you're running at that, that kind of heart rate, that intensity for an hour, then your heart is to constantly, constantly, constantly be filling up and pouring out that blood, taking it back, bringing it to the lungs, bringing it back to the heart, out to the system. It's constantly doing that um, repeatedly with basically no change in the intensity at which it's working. And it needs to be able to deliver that to the working muscles, which are often in the lower body. So you can see how we have to, we have to be working you know, pretty damn efficiently. And there are a number of variables that affect your ability to, to do that well, you know, um, so one of them would be the, the actual filling. So there's basically, there's the filling and there's the emptying. This, the filling is, is basically what you call diastole or the diastolic portion of your blood pressure. So if you've ever heard of systolic over diastolic, the top number over the bottom, bottom number, if you've ever been to the doctor and you know, they gave you a blood pressure reading, that's basically what you're looking at. Your diastolic is the filling time. So it's the time when that ventricle is really filling up with all the blood that it's about to pump out. And one of the things that happens in continuous exercise is that you've got a, a good ability to fill that ventricle up. You've got a, you've got time because, you know, if you were to think about squeezing, squeezing something that constantly keeps filling back up, if you're squeezing it super, super fast at 200 beats per minute, it has no time to fill back up. Okay. But if it's a bit slower, it has more time to fill back up. And that's one of the things that you see as an adaptation. Um, to exercise, to continuous training, to endurance training over time. One of the adaptations is that you get this, this increase in the left ventricle volume. You get an eccent it's called an eccentric um, hypertrophy pattern, but basically it's just, a, it's just a pattern whereby you get an increase in the volume of that chamber. Because if you've got an increase in the volume of the chamber and it's better at relaxing between beats, you've got a better ability to fill that up. And if you have a better ability to fill that up, every time you beat your heart, you're better able to get that blood out to the tissues that needs it. Okay. Yeah, the, way, the way I always conceptualize this, well, first of all, we should just say that because it does bear reminding people that, you know, your heart is not a static organ. Like obviously it is a static organ, but uh, it, it can adapt, you know, so adaptations can occur at the actual heart level, uh, independent of like the actual vascular system or the muscular system or the nervous system, or anything like that, like the actual heart, like again, think of it like a, a muscle. It is not the exact same, like as skeletal muscle, as you said, um, but it can still adapt. So adaptations can still play, take place, right? So that's the first thing. But secondly, the way I always conceptualize this is, you know, if you ever have one of those like squeaky toys that you give to like a dog, you know, yeah. and like yeah. you, you squeak it and it goes, Wee! and it makes a fucking really big noise. And then you let it all fill back up and then you squeak it again, it makes a really big noise, right? But if you, you know, really fast do it, like the, the squeaks are like, like really, really slow. And in, in between, you're, you're not actually giving it enough time to take that air in and then give a, a bigger squeak you know so while you can get lots of little squeaks out it's not like the ideal if your heart was you know unbelievably efficient you would be able to fill up completely in between each one of those 
little squeaks. So effectively, like if you're, if you're getting more volume into the heart, you're able to get more in, in the squeaky toy thing, get more air into that before you squeak again, you know? So you want to have like, to, to be good at like cardiovascular stuff, you want to be able to fill that up again before the squeak happens. So you want to have a, a thing that, you know, the air coming in, in the, the squeaky toy uh, instance, you know, is really efficient. And, and same with the, the heart adaptations, because you want that big squeak. You know, you don't want these little, nee, 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 nee. like that's obviously good in, in certain circumstances. And obviously, you know, your heart is not a, an, a, an ever adaptable organ. Like you, you can still get to the, the limit of what it's going to be able to fill and stuff. But that's the way I kind of conceptualize it. Those squeaky toys, is it, again, it's effectively the same thing, except they're pumping air and your heart is pumping blood. Yeah, that's exactly it. And I mean, like an even, an even a closer, closer thing is just is, is pumping up a tire. You know, if you're pumping up a tire, you want to be able to pull, pull back up the pump as far as you can. So you get a lot of air in there and then go back down rather than just staying at the bottom. Like, eh, 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 you know, it's just not, not very effective, not very efficient and exact same when it comes to the heart. So when you're looking at, you know, endurance athletes, people who are, you know, very cardiovascularly fit, they basically have a better ability to, to fill up um, between those beats. Um, and, and, and as a result, you know, they're fitter and they're able to exercise for longer because they're better at oxygenating those tissues and, and not generating um, quite as much of fatigue uh, as a result. So you've got that element. That's basically your kind of your, your filling portion. And then you've got the, the emptying portion, which is basically systole, it's called, or the systolic, the higher number on your blood pressure reading. So that's at the top. It's the top number. Um, and basically, that's when the heart muscle contracts and squeezes and pushes all the blood out okay so that is something that that does uh, adjust as well like that that kind of emptying phase that's adjusted during exercise so you know there's there's intrinsic um mechanisms by which when the heart is really stretched it's better at contracting um it's like it's like when you kind of let's say if you go to the bottom of of any exercise that you do and you get to the bottom where the muscle is stretched you feel like if you bit of an extra go in you you know when you're doing a, a deadlift or something like that or the little bounce you get at the bottom of the squat it's not the exact same but i like to kind of think of it in that way and that's basically like the, the Frank Starling law of the heart is, is typically um, how people describe it. So that's kind of an intrinsic thing is that when you're feeling better, you get a better contraction, but you also get an increase in, in what's called contractility during exercise or your ability to produce force. And again, that's related to the nervous system and circulating hormones. So that really helps you to drive that blood out as effectively as possible. So they are the things that are going on during exercise. And if you think about, you think about that for a minute, um, one of the things you might think is that but what's, what's the story with, with heart rate and these endurance exercises? Because endurance trainees seem to have uh, really low heart rates, really low resting heart rates. And if you think about why that actually is, okay, your, car your cardiac output is basically the amount of blood that's, that's going, around, going around the body in, in any given minute. Okay, so that's the amount of blood that we're, that we're pumping out. And if you were to think about okay, if, a, if an endurance athlete at rest has a really low heart rate, are they just not getting oxygen to their tissues? Of course, that's not the case. The reason they're, they're able to have such a low resting heart rate is because they have a larger stroke volume. And your stroke volume is the amount of blood that you pump out with every beat of your heart. So that's going to be affected by the variables we just discussed. So one, the preload or the filling phase because if you can fill up more blood, then you've got, you've got more in there, your end diastolic volume, it's called. You've got more blood in there at the end of that filling phase. And if you can really effectively pump that out and you have as little as possible left at the end of the emptying phase, that means you're able to pump much more blood out. And that's your end systolic volume. So what blood is left in the heart? So if you had a large uh, filling phase, a large uh, end diastolic volume, but you were really bad at pumping it out, your stroke volume would be small. You know, similarly, if you had no ability to fill the heart, because let's say it's fibrotic, you know, there's a lot of fibrotic tissue in there because when the heart adapts in a healthy person, when they're doing exercise, you get the addition of this normal healthy muscle that's good at contracting, but in more pathological states, you know, people with certain cardiovascular diseases, you can get fibrotic tissue that isn't contractile and it's more resistant and as a result, their filling phase might be really compromised, you know? So that again is leading to a smaller stroke volume. So in fit, healthy people who are cardiovascularly fit, they've been doing their exercise for years, they're better 
at filling up and pumping out. And as a result, they're going to have a lower resting, resting heart rate, um, along with you know higher parasympathetic tone, so higher rest and digest input from the nervous system and the heart. And that's why they're able to, one, keep the oxygenation of all their tissues so they can maintain their cardiac output at a much lower resting heart rate because each beat is just far more efficient. Okay. Yeah, it can also be said with that as well. Like, again, you have to look at the, <clears throat> the cardiovascular system in, tr- in the context of, you know, the heart, the vascular system and the lungs, you know, like the, their lungs also adapt. So these individuals that are cardiovascularly fit, you know, they start or they're able to uh, oxygenate the blood much more efficiently. You know, and this is why you also start seeing, so if they're able to oxygenate the blood more efficiently, because that's effectively, you want to think of it like that, the role of the heart in, in this context is to get oxygen to the tissues, you know, and then obviously to take you know, carbon dioxide back and stuff. Um, but the, 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 the role here is to have an efficient transfer of oxygen. That's what we're, what's going on. So you also get you know, lung adaptations that, you know, facilitate better oxygen transfer. But this is why you also start seeing other things uh, play into this. For example, you might have nothing wrong, as I'm going to say, quote unquote, wrong with your heart, but you know you smoke, and all of a sudden your lungs aren't working as efficiently, so that you're not able to get as much oxygen into the blood. Or again, you have something like again like fibrotic tissue in your lungs, and all of a sudden you know there's actually nothing again, quote unquote, wrong with your heart. But your resting heart rate has to be elevated because it's trying to get more oxygen to those tissues and it's not able to you know, fully oxygenate the blood as it goes by. So it, it starts you know, contracting more. And this is why you start seeing people do stuff like they get stressed and they start hyperventilating. You know? like all of this stuff does play in together. It can't be just viewed in isolation in terms of, oh, I'm only looking for heart adaptations it's like that doesn't happen it's you know there's no singular system we are a, a whole system yes absolutely sir um where was i where was i i was talking okay endurance training we kind of finished the continuous exercise stuff so hopefully it kind of makes sense you know what what is basically going on there you know it's basically just intended to be to be an overview um the resistance training is interesting because it's um it's definitely something that gets a lot less discussion when it comes to um, what's actually happening at the level of the heart. But basically what you can think about here, if we go back to the back to the start of the discussion, what I said was that if you've got an increase in your systemic vascular resistance, so you've got an increase in the resistance of the vessels into which the heart is pumping, you're going to have you know higher blood pressure there. The heart has to work harder against that. Okay. And that, that's basically what happens during resistance training, because what happens during resistance training is you're contracting your muscles like really, really hard. And the reality is that your arteries are within those muscles a lot of the time. So the arteries are flowing within the muscles, or if it's in your abdomen, it's kind of in the, in, the, in the center of your abdominal cavity where all these organs and stuff are being compressed by the muscles that are contracting around it. For whatever reason, um, what you have to understand is that all the, the muscles are just contracting. And as a result, the arteries are dealing with this extra resistance pushing against them. Um, so the pressure is going to be really, really high in those vessels as a result. So when the heart is beating during resistance training, like let's say you're doing a deadlift and it's taking, like when your heart is beating during that concentric and everything is braced and everything is contracted and the arteries are really resistant, your heart has to work so hard during that. And as a result, what you get is, you know, you get these adaptations in the heart that basically follow that. So you get this increase in thickness um, of the wall of the heart so that it's stronger, so that it's better to overcome, it's better able to overcome those vessels. Um, just, that just are- to kind of make it a little bit more visual, <clears throat> even though it's a shit analogy, if you think of all those blood vessels like a hose, you know, if someone steps on yeah. the hose, <clears throat> if you had an ability to turn up the pressure of the water coming out, you might be able to overcome that individual stepping on the hose, you know, exactly. and like you say, like a, it's a firefighter's hose, you know, if they're able to, you know, really put through a huge amount of water at high pressure through that, you know, obviously that's going to get the water through the person stepping on it, you know, they're, they're gone. That's not there. You're going to overcome that, you know? So if you're able to increase the pressure, you're going to be able to overcome this, you know, contraction mediated, like thinning, thinning, yeah, of uh, the, the arteries and veins and stuff. Exactly. Um, and that's, that's exactly it. Basically, we have to find a way that we can produce more force. It's, it's, 
it's the exact same as res- resistance training. Basically, like it's like you were previously squatting 140 kilos and suddenly put a hundred, someone put 180 kilos in the bar. Are you going to have to work harder? Yes, you're going to have to work harder. You're going to have to build bigger muscles, stronger muscles that are able to overcome that load again. And the same thing happens in the heart. So during resistance training, we've got an increase in resistance, easy to remember, resistance training. And as a result, the heart has to work harder to really pump that blood out um, against that resistance. So you do get those adaptations of thickening of the, the wall of the heart. Now, this is where, you know, you can, if you, if you haven't read information related to, to exercise, you can kind of be like, oh, but isn't that really bad? You know, because like it's, it's often, you're often taught um, that in thickening of the heart is a bad thing because what basically that's a, a cardiomyopathy or hypertrophy, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. You hear of these different conditions, but these are pathological conditions in most cases. So they're conditions in which someone has a big, massive, thickened heart um, for potentially genetic reasons, for reasons related to lack of oxygenation, many different reasons that go into that being a pathological state. So that's important to realize because in that's in those states, in those disease states, you have massive thickening of the heart that is much greater than you'd experience during exercise. And the tissue quality is different to healthy muscle. Okay, so that's really important to understand because if you just think thicker heart equals bad, then that's going to give you a bit of a, a kind of a reductionist understanding of what's actually going on because that's not the case during exercise. During exercise with resistance training, yes, we do get thickening of the heart, but it, one, it's not within the parameters, um, or often it's not of of pathological. Um, the pathological categorization of this cardiomyopathy or thickening of the heart, but also it's not, um, it's, it's, it's tissue quality and it's, it's adaptive. It's physiological. It's happening for a very specific reason. Um, so that's just something just on that as well. Like this is not like, again, it, it makes it, it muddies the water. It makes it even harder to understand what's going on as well. When you bring in something like uh, steroids where like yeah. you get uh, uh, effectively an increase of, you know, muscle deposition, like that actually happens at the heart as well. You know, so someone that is healthy and fit and all of a sudden they die at 30 from heart disease and you're like, how did that happen? And then you realize it's like, oh, you've actually been taking grams of drugs, you know, steroids per week. And it's like, this is why you see all these bodybuilders like not living past 50 and they all die of like heart disease or liver disease. That's the liver disease is you know, related to, you know, just taking certain types of steroids and those steroids having to be metabolized and stuff. But the the heart disease stuff, it's like, like you the hypertrophy is happening at the heart tissue level itself yeah. you know and especially if you are you know we maybe we'll talk about like the you know thinking of different parts of the heart they that they're slightly different adaptations and you know they're getting a, a more negative thickening of that heart you know um so like that kind of muddies the water as well because then you start thinking like oh is resistance training bad for the heart and obviously then as well like as we said, there, there is innervation. The nervous system plays a role. And like, obviously if you're really like hyped up and you know stressed out to hit your new PR, like that's, that's a different stimulus to the heart versus, you know, that kind of, Oh, I'm rest and digest relaxed. You know, like if, if you are a, a stimulant junkie and you literally have 30 coffees per day, like that's a different stimulus to the heart, you know? And um, so all of those things play in. And like, again, this is why it's, it's very hard to, effectively manage the heart and because there's so many inputs that you have to just be aware of so many things yeah and and i think the the kind of like as anabolic users and people who have died in the bodybuilding world and powerlifting world like i think they do give a bad name sometimes to resistance training in general because obviously people in the public are like oh that person lift weights look how bad it was for their heart but as you said you've got this runaway growth of the heart and you've got runaway increases in blood pressure like they're often not looking after um the basics of health a lot of the time and also like one of the other things is that like using high amounts of anabolic steroids like people who do that long term often associated with um people who also use lots of recreational drugs and stuff like that and i mean you know the use of the use of cocaine like basically what that can do is like that can give you vasospasm spasm of your blood vessels that go into the heart and can give you a heart attack. And I think it's the leading cause of cardiac death in, in people under 30 or whatever. So, and the, the thing there is like, you don't know when that's going to happen. So, I mean, like just 
taking cocaine every weekend for the lols with the lads like it's like all right fine you know that's cool but you know there's a risk there and you could just die and you that that's it um but yeah anyway we won't, we won't go down the the drugs route um resistance training as i said right main thing you're looking at there is you're looking at a pressure overload you're looking at an increase in resistance and the heart is going to adapt accordingly like you can very simply dichotomize the resistance training versus endurance training um kind of a categorization of uh, what the exercise is like in a volume overload versus pressure overload way of looking at it. That's how it's often described um, in the research is that like they describe endurance training as a volume overload because we've got this constant high volume output. Whereas in the, in the resistance training setting, it's a pressure overload because it's really the, the pressure that's being increased by the, the resistance overall. But the important thing to understand there is that like, if you're doing lots of weight training, like you're also getting a high degree of volume overload. You know, as I said, in between your sets, in between uh, times when you're actually bracing versus not bracing, etc. If you look at your average heart rate throughout a workout, you are still increasing the amount of, of volume that is going through the heart. So it's it's mixed adaptations. Um, and one thing worth noting, just because I did bring some kind of discussion of pathology into this in terms of like the the hypertrophy and stuff, like one of the, the ongoing challenges for people in this area, um, like researching this and doctors and stuff is trying to find who are like, cause the problem is if you have an athlete's heart and you're dealing with an athlete's heart and you do, you know, certain exams and stuff, it's sometimes hard to tell, are these pathological adaptations that have developed in someone, um, or are these physiological adaptations or like more prob the, the thing that's more of a problem is both. Because the difficult thing is if you have someone who has a genetic um, predisposition to this development of, of hy the hypertrophy in the heart or the cardiomyopathy, and that puts them at the risk, at risk of like sudden athlete, de athlete death syndrome, like that's the thing that's, that's kind of the big, the big, the big problem for people. Um, that, that's difficult to, to kind of tease out. So what I, what I, well, the reason I wanted to bring that up is because if you've been to your doctor and they've said, oh, I'm concerned about the size of your heart or, you know, I'm concerned about certain cardiovascular parameters. Do not turn around and say, um, oh, no, it's absolutely fine. It's just exercise. I've just been training and that's it. Like that, there's a chance that might not be the case. So forget that for the moment. Um, don't just think that you're fine just because you exercise. Um, but in general, exercise, resistance training and endurance training, super beneficial for your heart and cardiovascular system absolute win um so do you have anything to add there before we move on from the from the exercise just, stuff just, just on that exercise stuff like this is why it's probably a good idea to have like a mixed modal training parameters you know like in terms of like you want to get some adaptations from the you know the higher pressure stuff and you also want to get some adaptations from the higher volume stuff and while there is like obviously carry over like a really good way to see this in action is if you think you are relatively fit and you have some sort of heart rate monitor available to you like do your resistance training work it and look at where your heart rate you know goes up and down and then look at the average you know heart rate like you'll find like the average heart rate when you do like a resistance training session and you are relatively fit it's like 120 130 you know like you're on, on average you know so it's like okay so like obviously that's not the case for everyone some people are like 90 their averages and they just fucking really good at recovering in between sets and stuff you know but you look at that and it's like okay so if, if i showed you my average heart rate was 130 for an hour training session and i didn't tell you what training i did you would just go all right cool so you've you've got some cardiovascular you know adaptations here in terms of you know volume overload you know and mm -hmm. um, but then i show you the exact data and the, the peaks and throts and then you're like oh okay so maybe that's not the case you know so like i just don't like the, the way people make this kind of a clear-cut delineation when in reality it's like no like this this stuff bleeds over into each other and there's adaptations going all over the place that you know yeah you want to be specific in the adaptations that you're trying to target but you do get some overflow into other adaptations occurring at the same time now doing resistance training is that going to get you as you know cardiovascularly fit as you possibly could be you know probably not so as a result you probably want to do some sort of mixed training you know like you probably do want to get some uh, aerobic adaptations like specifically and you also want to get some anaerobic adaptations specifically you know and again a, a mixed you know modal training uh, program where you do some lower intensity stuff and you do some higher intensity stuff that you know makes a lot of sense and a lot of those adaptations like if you're not trying to be you know 
the, the pinnacle of athletic development, like you can get a lot of those adaptations doing very basic stuff, you know, like you can do three hard sets of an exercise that really pushes, you know, like the exertion level. And then you can also get like 10,000 steps per day. And it's just very like low level, keeping your heart rate. Like you go for like two walks per day. Like that stuff does add up to create meaningful change. You know, you're not, you're not going to be the best of the best athletic wise just doing like that, that low, but you can still get meaningful adaptations doing very, very little. Yes, absolutely. And as you said, it's really important not to just get, leave this conversation with an understanding that, oh yeah, cool. Uh, the heart and the blood vessels, that's the whole story. Like that's just absolutely not the whole story. Like the, the differences between endurance and resistance training go far beyond this. You know what the, at the level of the muscle, like you're very clearly de- dealing with different adaptations. You know, if you're, if you're doing lots of endurance training over time, you're generally going to have, you know, changes in, in changes in fiber type. You're going to have changes in the number of mitochondria in your muscles, which are basically there to do all of this work to produce the energy in the first place okay um and you're also getting differences in 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 angiogenesis the growth of new blood vessels and stuff like that so if you're if you're you know really cardiovascularly fit and you're doing lots of endurance training there's going to be adaptations there in terms of branching of new blood vessels and stuff like that because it's it's not like you're just born with your blood vessels full stop they adapt they can grow grow into new places etc um so all that is is worth just remembering here that the, the adaptations go go far beyond this um but yeah like in summary like hopefully you can just kind of take away from this that yes the the demand for tissue oxygenation increases in both resistance and endurance training so you're going to have some crossover in the adaptations but basically the further you go in any one direction on that spectrum so if you're looking at like the adaptations in a in a marathon runner versus a power lifter the more different um, those adaptations are, are going to be. Uh, but in general, you shouldn't be thinking of endurance training or continuous training as just being like, that's the mode of cardiovascular training because resistance training does train your cardiovascular system. Interventions that use resistance training um, does actually reduce blood pressure, which is somewhat counterintuitive in the short term, at least. Um, importantly, when you do look at differences long-term, like uh, do endurance trainees have lower blood pressure than weightlifters? The answer is yes, they do have lower blood pressure, but in short-term interventions, resistance training reduces blood pressure. So there's some unanswered questions there that could probably be answered if you were to really think about it, like that there might be some other things going on. So for example, if you're taking a sample of weightlifters, especially if they're competitive weightlifters, is there a chance that some of them might be using performance enhancing drugs? Potentially, you know, depends on the level, depends on the, the federation, etc. cetera. Um, additionally, if you think about what is the goal of a weightlifter over time or a competitive strength athlete, their goal is probably to gain weight chronically. So if they've been gaining weight for decades versus the endurance trainee, who's probably been weight stable or has spent lots of time in a deficit, that could be accounting for differences um, in blood pressure there. You could also be looking at changes in their diet over time. So culturally, there's probably a difference in the diet that a, a power lifter or a strength trainee might consume versus an endurance trainee. So there's all of these other variables um, that, do, that do kind of go into this equation. So I'm not necessarily saying that just because resistance training reduces blood pressure in the long term that, or, or in the short term, that that is enough for you long term because if you're going to your doctor and you see my blood pressure is 150 over 90 um, and you're saying to yourself oh yeah but i already do resistance training so i'm fine it that that does not mean you're fine you know you may need to consider right should i add um, some conditioning training should i change my diet should i listen to my doctor and take some blood pressure medications all these things need to to go into the equation uh, but yeah that's just a review point and just to kind of finish off finish off this episode i already mentioned the that we, like we will touch on this in more detail, but just to just to quickly touch on it while it's on your mind, we touched on resting heart rate, and resting heart rate is something that people do, people do track and people use as a marker of health, and, and rightfully so, um, and cardio their cardiovascular fitness, for example. And as I said, people who are fitter, um, people who have a higher level of fitness, especially cardiovascular fitness, tend to have lower resting heart rates. Um, and that is the result of them being more efficient at, pu- at pumping out blood and having a higher 
input or tone from the parasympathetic branch of the nervous system or the relaxed branch of the nervous system acting on the heart. Okay. So that's basically um, explaining why they would have a lower resting heart rate, but it also um, is affected by many, many other variables um, such as, you know, whether like if you've had caffeine before you've measured it, like that's going to affect it. Um, if you've taken drugs, that's going to affect it. If you're, um, if you're, yeah, if you've, if you've slept poorly, if you're stressed, if you've, you know, changes in hydration and stuff like that, that can affect it. So your heart rate is always going to be a dynamic variable. But when we're looking at those chronic measures of your actual resting heart rate, um, that is something that's going to be improved uh, with a higher level of fitness. And also, like, if you're, if you're in a calorie deficit and you've lost weight, you're going to have a lower resting heart rate, you know, and, and, and that's fairly like intuitive. If you think about uh, what would happen when you have low energy availability, like all of your systems are going to be trying to, you know, be a bit more efficient and, and basically do as little as they possibly have to. So when you're at the end of a diet, it's very likely that you'll have um, a much lower resting heart rate than at the start. And that could be yeah, that's also one of those contributors to yeah, the meat, like the non-exercise, like yeah. thermogenesis, even though it's technically it's not meat, um, but it is like background energy expenditure. <clears throat> this also goes into, you know, when people are like, oh, uh, my metabolism is broken and they're like 200 pounds overweight. Like realistically, like their metabolism is way quicker or more expensive whatever i don't know and um, like they're, they're expending way more energy just as a background because first of all they have to move themselves around and they weigh 200 pounds like the 200 pounds overweight uh, so just moving that 200 pounds around you know they expend more calories and thus their metabolism is higher but also individuals that have you know higher resting heart rates you know just resting you are expending more energy yeah. just from the heart perspective you know that's not necessarily like you could have uh a very high heart rate and very low muscle mass and, you know, versus someone that has a very low heart rate and very high muscle mass, you know, like the, I'm not saying that this explains everything, but this is one of the variables that goes into it. So if you are literally like you've 90 to a hundred beats per minute is your resting heart rate. It's like, yeah, you're pumping true energy. You know, this is also why like you see these people that are really stressed and they're trying to gain weight and they're like, I just, I just can't do it. You know, I really just can't do it. It's like, all right, you're burning true calories, just fucking stressing about this rather than just, you know, taking a break, having a little bit of a relax, bring things down, bring all that fucking catecholamine synthesis down, stop having all these stress hormones, stopping you from fucking actually building muscle. And all of a sudden your heart rate goes down to, you know, we'll say less, lower than 60. Like I always like to see lower than 60 as a measure of health. Now that's not like, obviously that's not across all boards. You know, like people can have a lower resting heart rate than 60 and still be unhealthy, you know, and obviously the further you get down, there's potential then again to be unhealthy, which I'm sure we'll touch on. Um, but, you know, that's a, that's a good marker. Like if you're like, all right, my heartbeat is less than one per second, that's probably a good place to be at for, you know, general health. Yeah. And like, that is an important point that like lower is just not necessarily better because like, if you're, if you're at the end of a diet, you know, and you've been killing yourself, like you're a bodybuilder or someone who's just trying to get stupid lean for a photo shoot, you might be like, Oh, look, I'm so fit. My heart rate's 38 or whatever. But like, realistically, you're just like subclinical hypothyroidism because you've starved yourself and you've got no food in your system. And if you were to actually try and go and do a workout, you just wouldn't be able to do it at all. Like, so don't, don't use these metrics blindly as measures of fitness. Cause that's what some people do. It's like, Oh yeah, your resting heart rate has improved. Um, let's say you're a runner. Oh, my resting heart rate is way better. You know, it's, it's dropped by 10 beats per minute. And it's like, Oh yeah, have your running times changed? And they're like, Oh yeah, my running hasn't been great. It's like, then why do you care? You know, like it doesn't, it doesn't matter. Like, proxy measures. They're not the, the end yeah. goal. Yeah. And they're ultimately chronic things. Like that's the important thing to understand is that like, it's like, if I'm looking at your, your resting heart rate and you know, now versus 10 years from now and, and you see that, Oh, it's actually dropped by 20 beats per minute. And you also know you've been training in that time and your all your times have improved. It's like, yeah, that, that's a good proxy in that case, but it's not necessarily always the case. Um, that's also then, true for like blood cholesterol levels. Like people look at like transient changes. They're like, Oh, my blood cholesterol went or it changed over eight weeks. And it's like, yeah, like that's important to know that stuff. But like, realistically, we're looking at a chronic lifetime level of where your cholesterol is at. It's not just like, Oh, this week I had a load of extra saturated fat. So my cholesterol, I got it measured then. And you know, it was completely different than what it was four weeks ago when I got it measured. It's like, this is not 
indicative of like the, the long-term view that we're supposed to have for this health stuff, you know, like, yeah, that would make sense if, you know, the lifespan of a human was like two years, you know, knocking out a week at fucking super high levels. We're like, all right, that's, that's important to, to measure. You know, that's a week out of your two year lifespan. But if you're living to, you know, the average life expectancy is whatever fucking 86 to 90, you know, it's like a week out of that at a, a higher level of, you know, or a lower level or whatever, um, at any of these blood metrics, it's like it's, it's largely irrelevant. Yes, sir. Um, and then there's heart rate variability, which is it's it's intrinsic. It's fairly linked with your resting heart rate in, in some capacity. Like if you're talking about your rest, your heart rate variability, basically what you're talking about is the balance or imbalance more so between your sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system input. So I said earlier um, at the, in the discussion that when you're when you're in a more sympathetic state a more stressed state or you've got higher sympathetic input basically what happens is your heart begins to beat faster but as that begins to happen they also start to to it also starts to begin beating more symmetrically or consistently um so basically what you've got is you've got as you as you in input it into it more it's boom 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 very consistent okay it's like each beat is like the same distance from the last one so the variability begins to decrease considerably whereas if you're the endurance athlete let's say with a higher parasympathetic tone um the beats are further apart and because you're a bit more relaxed it's like yeah beat um, okay and you know another beat and it's like yeah okay another beat you know you can see that in your, if you're in that more at least i like to and I, like think about it that way it's like oh yeah i'm more relaxed or i can just kind of beat whenever i need to because i'm efficient i'm relaxed i'm cool you know and that's for that reason you've got higher heart rate variability so there's greater variability between um the time between uh those beats so basically if you were to look at like a an ecg you know you see them in the movies sometimes where you've got that kind of squiggly line that goes along the the red and white paper in the boxes and basically what they do to measure heart rate variability is you take you take one point um in that ecg in one heartbeat you ch you see what it what it compares to the, to the next heartbeat um, and then you see how those those times vary um, from heartbeat to heartbeat over time and you're basically when you're when you're measuring heart rate variability with these kind of watches and and strap chest straps and stuff like that um, that basically tries to um, have a proxy measure um, of basically what what the variability might be between those so in summary if you have higher heart rate variability, so um, you've got more parasympathetic input, it generally indicates you're more, you're probably more relaxed, you're probably uh, less stressed, you probably got um, a higher level of cardiovascular fitness, and that's why people try to associate heart rate variability with um, things like recovery and things like cardiovascular fitness. Um, it was kind of initially used as more of a, a cardiovascular health marker or trying to predict. Um, who would have cardiovascular events um, more useful in some contexts, less useful in others. But basically, it's, it's basically trying to see, okay, is, th is this person having a really high uh, sympathetic input, which would happen in some, some cases, like, you know, heart failure and stuff like that. Um, and yeah, that's, that's basically yeah, the, 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 summary. Way always, the way I always kind of think of it. It's like, cause again, if you think of your, your heart, it is a beating organ. So it's, it's very similar to the beat of music for example, right? So heart rate variability, like for example, just counting the beats per minute in a song gives you some information of the song. You know, if you have like 30 beats per minute in a song versus something that has 140 beats per minute in a song, you can tell something about the quality or the, the type of song that is. Like 30 beats, you're gonna be like, that's a more relaxed song, you know? Versus a song that has, you know, 140 beats, you're like, that's a more, you know, upbeat song like it's it's more of say a stressed song right um but and a heart rate variability like that's just the, the heart rate you know the beats per minute heart rate variability is trying to tell you a little bit more about the the, the quality of those songs and i don't mean like if they're good or bad but i mean like you could have a song that is 140 beats per minute and it'd be a very like happy summery type song versus you could also have a song that is 140 beats per minute and it's a very, you know, stressful song. You know, it's a, you know, it's a type of music that you'd play in the background of, you know, a horror movie, you know? Uh, again, you could have a song that is 30 beats per minute. And again, it's a very like smooth, relaxed song, but then you could also have a song that is 30 beats per minute. And it's a very, you know, they're, they're using different notes that make it very eerie, jarring, that kind of stuff that it's like, oh, I, like I, you feel on edge with that song, you know? So 
like the heart rate variability is trying to tell you something about the 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 quality of those songs like what that song is or what those beats mean in the context like if you were listening to that song it's like okay a, a higher heart rate would be a more relaxed song or you know um versus or sorry a heart, higher heart rate variability would be a more relaxed song versus you know a lower heart rate variability would be more of a, a you know a jarring song and like that that's what heart rate variability is trying to tell you but that's still not all of the information about that song you know you still can have that song be an enjoyable song to listen to even though it has notes out of place and you know you actually like or the activity that you're doing actually does well with a certain type of song like you know like a certain scary music enhances the the film that you're watching you know so even though heart rate variability is telling you something about the quality of the song it's not giving you the full context of when that song is being played you know like you might as a certain individual want uh, a lower heart rate variability you know so it's it's trying to give you more information but it's not the whole story yes sir absolutely you know you could have you could have your low heart rate variability it's kind of like you know hard Russian hard bus music it's just like whereas like your higher heart rate variability is more like uh you know Phil Collins like a uh, drum solo and that's like that's relaxing even though it still feels like quite fast paced but in general like your heart your resting heart rate and your heart rate variability like they're gonna kind of follow each other like the vast majority of the time and that's one of the reasons like I just don't have my clients track their heart rate variability anymore. I'm just like, like I used to have some people do it, but like when I was using, when I was trying to use the information, I'm like, man, there's nothing that I'm getting here that I couldn't get by asking you, how are you feeling this morning? Or just getting you to do a well being kind of score or whatever. Um, and, and like when it comes to like tracking resting heart rate, it's like, that's a much simpler thing to track because if you've got a watch, it does it automatically. And if you want to track it like manually, you just, you know, measure your heartbeats from your wrist or, or your neck or whatever for 15 seconds and multiply it by four. Whereas with heart rate vari variability, you have to like, like if you're doing it supine lying down, like you lie down or if you're doing it sitting, you have to relax for a couple of minutes then measure it for a couple of minutes and then, you know, see, see what it was like. So if, if the information isn't that useful, I'm just like, ah, I'm not gonna, not gonna sweat having you to do that too much. Um, but yeah, I think that was, that was everything that we wanted to cover in this podcast. Really. Um, you should hopefully have a good understanding of like, all right, what the heart does overall. Um, some of its basic physiology, as I said, best thing you could do would be to reinforce that with the articles that we've written. Um, because like the intent is that, we can now go on and discuss more about how exercise affects blood pressure, um, how diet affects things like blood pressure and blood cholesterol and lipids and lipoproteins and all these fun things um, so that you have an understanding of, you know, right, I know how the heart works. I know what the role of exercise and nutrition and preserving my heart health are. And then obviously the goal is that you live a longer, healthier life, you know? Yeah, like as I said at the start of this, this is purely entertainment. You can take from it whatever the fuck you want. I don't care if you literally listen to this and go, these two guys are actually fucking stupid. Why does Patrick keep using analogies? Why can't he just fucking state facts? You know, maybe you hate that, you know? But again, you use this for whatever purpose you want to use this for. I'm not telling you should live a healthy, happy life. Maybe you hate yourself. I don't fucking know. Do whatever the fuck you want to do. We live in a free society, so do it, you know? Um, but yeah, so again, as Gary said, this is basically opening up the series we're going to do a few more episodes in the future. So again, if you do have questions, you can always throw them in. If you do, or like, or if you are like, oh, I don't know about this certain topic or this certain concept, like the first thing I would suggest always doing is doing a search of our website because I could not tell you the amount of times that people ask questions that a simple search, like the, our website has a search function and a simple search of our website would reveal that we've written four or five articles that are extremely in-depth on that topic, you know? And while I enjoy helping people, I don't enjoy people not respecting the fact that, you know, we're taking time <laughs> to, you know, write these articles and then they're like, no, but I want you to talk to me specifically and, you know, actually link, link me the articles and show me exactly, you know, where I should get this information. You know, it's like, just do a search of our YouTube, just do a search of our website. And if we've written about it or talked about it, you'll probably find it there if you can't find it shoot us a question you know and um, but having said that if you do have questions about heart disease heart related stuff you know drop them in the 
either the comments if you're listening to this on uh, on YouTube or drop them into the question box um, on our website. Um, but anyway, Gary, so where can people find us? What are our services, etc.? Um, you can find more about us, um, firstly, by joining the Triage Method community on Facebook. That's our free open access Facebook group, which is actually pretty active these days, so I would recommend getting involved. Um, you could also join the Triage Method newsletter, which will be linked below. Um, so that's a useful, useful resource if you want us to send you useful information from around the internet, along with the articles and stuff that we're putting out. So if you are one of those people who just doesn't come across our content, then that'd be a good place to, to catch up. Um, and, and with the, with the uh, newsletter, the recommended resources, like we often do send out things like, you know, related to maybe the cardiova cardiovascular disease and stuff like that. So, I mean, if you're, if you're interested in this stuff, do keep up there um, and follow us on social media. Of course, that would be helpful. The triage, triage method, at triage method on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, most recommended is YouTube because obviously it's pretty unique and you know you can sit down and watch us talk for 24 minutes or whatever um, and there's and on us you know you can't do that on Instagram which is shit the version um, and other than that you know online coaching space is available group coaching space is available um, and the most important thing that we wanted to let you know is the coaches corner which is going to be basically an educational resource for coaches and interested trainees that's going to be launching in the next month or so. So what we would recommend is that you go to the description box below, pre-register your interest. You're not committing to anything, but we will let you know further information about that if you do sign up there. Yeah, because there is going to be an initial huge discount um, for those interested because I want to get the, the people who are you know getting the first dish, as Jocko says, you know, I want to reward those people that are on the path, on the, the, the triage train, um, initially, see you, Gary. Um, like, I want to reward those individuals. So, if you are interested, like, sign up again. It's literally just collecting your your email address so that when stuff actually you know initiates and it starts, you are getting that information straight into your inbox. So you can be like, right, I'm ready to sign up. Or you know, maybe you want more information about it before you sign up. Like, there is a full you know, sales page if you want to call it that, um, and you can sign up on that sales page, read a bit more about what we're offering. Um, and then also, you know, register your interest. And then if you are interested, when it launches, you will get that initial discount, which will probably run the discount for like a month, maybe two months. Um, cause I know people, you know, it is in the middle of a lockdown. People are like, Oh money. I don't know if I can commit to this. Um, and I don't want people not getting a good discount purely because, you know, they're only just getting back into the swing of things with business and you know, whatever, everything that's going on. Um, but that is where you can register your interest if you are interested. Anyway, I have nothing else to say. Gary is gone, no doubt, to urinate. So I'm going to wrap this up. Peace out. Enjoy. And as always, it is too easy.